Hi everyone, welcome back to the workshop and today we've got something a little bit different. I've managed to pick up this GTEC model 7128 EEPROM programmer. This thing dates from about the mid 80s. Uh, the manual was last updated in 1988 so I presume the thing was on the go for uh, a few years before that. And uh, what attracted to me to it is a bit of an old school EEPROM programmer. Uh, as you know, I do like my EEPROM programmers. I've uh, got my Dataman S4, the cheap Chinese ones, and uh, a couple of others. But this uh, old school 7128 caught my eye because of the serial interface. I've managed to download the software for it from GTEx website and I do actually have the manual for it. Um, it's come from the States so it is actually uh, 110, 120 volts operation um, so I will have to convert it to uh, 240 volts for use in the UK so that will be part of a modification I'm going to make to it and uh, then we'll try and get it up and running. I'm going to also take a look inside obviously take a look at the uh, circuit and work out how it operates. Although I don't have the circuit diagram for it, I did contact GTEx website because there is still a live website, although it looks looks a little bit outdated. I'm not sure if they're really uh, doing anything right now, but I got no response and I sent a couple of emails. So uh, we're going to wing it without a circuit diagram. Let's open it up and see how we get on. So I've already taken the four screws out of it. Well, actually, there was only three. There was one missing, so I'll need to find one of those. It won't be metric, so I might have a bit of a job finding that. And here we go. So it looks like a quite a simple board. We've got the transformer at the top, which I will be replacing because it's just got a single primary on it. Uh, there's no tap to allow me to convert it. You've got the secondary coming down on the main board here, the two reds and the white there. You've got the serial interface uh, cabling over on the right hand side. You've got a microcontroller here, a microprocessor here, an 8035, an NEC, an NEC job. That's quite old school as well. You've got an EEPROM, a 2732, what to be holding the software for running the, the whole thing. And over here we've got an 82C43. When I first looked at this, I thought it was a, a RAM, an 8-bit RAM IC. But it's not. It's an I.O. expander. And probably what that's for is there's not enough I.O. capability on the microprocessor itself to connect to the various pins on the ZIF socket. You've also got down here a SIM4LS 373. That was, that's a latch and that'll be used to tie in the EEPROM into the microprocessor. Uh, this is a, a, a ROMless microprocessor. Uh, this particular variant of that series anyway and uh, I suspect that uh, this has just been used as part of the glue circuitry to tie the EEPROM in. Over on the left hand side you've got a 74 ls 174 that's a six-way D-type flip-flop. Uh, up here we've got a 74 ls 2 that's a four-way NOR gate and then interestingly we've got up here we've got some transistors in small groups but we'll come back to that in a minute actually. Over on the right hand side we've got a little circuit here consisting of a couple of transistors and a regulator I think and a couple of pots and I think what that's doing is generating the plus 25 or the plus 21 or indeed the plus 12 and a half volts that is used as part of the programming circuit for the EEPROMs. So what we've got is what looks like three groups of three transistors here with all the passives round about it. Possibly another couple along here, not too sure. But uh, I'm taking a look at this group of three here. And what it's being used for is control over VPP or in, in this particular group is anyway. And what's that all about? Well... Depending on what EEPROM you've got plugged in, you might have a 24 pin EEPROM plugged in, you might have a 28 pin, you might have a different model, different manufacturer, and the pin designations on each of those can vary, especially between the 24 and the 28 pin devices, for instance. So looking at our typical 28 pin EEPROM, like a 27128, pin 1 on that EEPROM is VPP. Now what's VPP? Well, 
in order to write data to an EEPROM, you need to set VPP to usually 21 or 25 volts, something like that. It can vary between different manufacturers. And when you're reading from the EEPROM, you might want to set that to 5 volts, if I remember correctly. And depending on possibly a completely different 28 pin device, that pin might need to be tied to 0 volts. So this little circuit here is responsible for applying the correct voltage as instructed by the microprocessor onto that pin. So let's take a look at the schematic that I've drawn up for that. So here we go, here's the three transistors, you've got two NPN transistors and a PNP transistor. Down here you've got the D-type flip-flops, there's two flip-flops used per circuit and over here we've got a NOR gate, one just being used. So down below I've drawn up the CPU and how it connects into this. And over here, this is the line on this particular group that's running off to pin one of the ZIF socket i.e. on a 28 pin device that would normally be VPP. So in order to set 25 volts on here requires the manipulation of two outputs from the microprocessor. In this particular case DB2 and DB5. They're just two bits on one of the 8 bit ports. So over on the right hand side I've drawn a little truth table on how it interacts with the rest of the circuit. So in order to set the output to 25 volts will require DB2 and DB5 being set low. Now looking at the D-type flip-flops you can see that DB2 and DB5 both tie to D input on both the flip-flops and the Q outputs go to the rest of the circuit. The clock and the reset pins on both the flip-flops are actually tied together. Both clocks go to the right pin on the micro processor and the reset pin is actually tied to the reset circuit for the microprocessor which has got its own little discrete circuit for power on reset. So as per the truth table in order to get the outputs from both the flip-flops to 0 volt i.e. low it will require setting DB2 and DB5 low. Now following the flip-flop law Q follows D after each rising clock pulse, therefore when the right pin returns back high again that's when whatever's on D will be clocked over to Q. So at that point there you will have both those two outputs set low. And from there because both inputs on the NOR gate are low that means the output will be high. So if you follow that through this transistor will be turned on and in turn, this transistor here, the PMP transistor, will be turned on as well. And then, therefore, 25 volts will come down through this 10 ohm resistor and out to pin 1 of the ZIF socket. Alternatively, you might want 5 volts on the pin 1. That's achieved, according to my little truth table, high and low for DB2 and DB5. So, we, same as before, I've set DB2 to high, DB5 to low, and that will give a high and a low input onto this NOR gate which will result in the output from the NOR gate going low. This pin here, this line here will be low and therefore this MPN transistor will be turned off. Therefore it's basically not in circuit and therefore 5 volts will then conduct down through this blocking diode through the 30 ohm resistor and out to pin one of the ZIF. Alternatively, you might want 0 volts on pin 1 of the ZIF. That's achieved by a couple of different ways. I'll just mention one of them. It's by setting both DB2 and DB5 high, which will put both inputs to the NOR gate high, which will result in the output going low. Therefore, as before, this transistor will be turned off and this one will be turned off. No 25 volts. But now, this time, this line here is high turns on this transistor here which basically grounds the, this line here to pin one of the ZIF. And there we have it, a kind of tri-state control over pin one of the ZIF. And as, as I showed in the PCB you've got at least 
uh, three or four of these groups, probably going to different pins in the ZIF, coming from different pins on the ports. Therefore, the software's got full control over what happens on the various pins on the ZIF socket. And other than that, we've got a 5 volt regulator uh, TO220 package both mounted down on the base plate there and just interfaced direct up onto the PCB. So 5 volt supply for the microprocessor, etc. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to check and see how it operates at 120 volts. I've got a 120 volt transformer off screen here and uh, we'll power it up and we'll do some probing around the circuit and see what we can pick up. Okay, so we've got power on at the moment and I'm going to use this tab over here as my zero volts because the 5 volt regular is actually grounded to the plate and let's go straight away onto the output pin of the regulator just to see what we've got and we've got 5.0 volts DC perfect so at least I know that the 5 volt regulator is okay so let's switch over to AC now and just going to probe the secondary on the transformer and let's see what sort of voltages we're getting there obviously it's under load and we've got 13.6 volts AC on the other side 14.5 and across the outside 28 volts AC so it does indeed look like it's a 24 volt transformer if we look at the uh, transformer itself it's a Mauser device and it does actually say 115 volt primary 24 volt secondary what's that 0.3 of an amp the other thing we've got is a 25 way d-type connector here which is interfaced down onto the pcb as you'll notice not all the pins are interfaced there because this is just a serial protocol that's been used on this d-type and it looks like a standard pin configuration you've got uh, Pins 2 and 3 are normally your RX and TX. You've got pin 7 was ground if I remember. And way off in its own there was that pin 20 I believe. And that was something like DTR. And the other pins will just be the other handshaking lines on that D-type. So we'll need to make up a cable for that. Luckily the manual does have the wiring. So whilst I've got power going in, I am actually going to probe around this area here. These two pots I believe probably going to be used to set up the 25 volts or the 21 volts possibly even the 12 and a half volts programming voltage for the VPP pin so let's probe around there and see what we've got we've got a couple of tracks coming away off from that part of the circuit so let's probe this one here and we've got 25 volts there that would seem to make sense that was not got anything much on it uh, not really picking up anything else. I'm just going to probe around pretty quickly without too much detail. 12.2 volts there. Okay, so I've reverse engineered this section over here with the two transistors, the regulator, the two pots, etc. Let's take a look at my little schematic that I've drawn up and see if we can work out how this section's working. First of all, a little bit of theory. There's a 78L12 12 volt regulator, 100 milliamp job as part of that circuit there. Now, normally the common of the regulator would be tied to ground, then you'll be feeding in something like 15 volts and you'll get 12 volts output in the case of a 12 volt, a 78L12. However, if you take a diode and forward bias it down to ground on the common pin you will get 0.7 of a volt or thereabouts volt drop across that diode now you're always going to get 12 volts across out and com on the regulator but relative to ground you're going to get 12.7 volts it's not an ideal way to use these regulators because uh, temperature coefficients come into it. 0.7 of a volt can vary in, re in relation to temperature and you've also got current there as well so you're yeah, talking about big diodes but anyway as a quick hack this can be done. So this is a small schematic that I've drawn up 
and this is how I think it's working. You've got the two transistors and actually there's a third one off the side uh, which is actually part of the circuit as well. And so there's the regulator there, in and out, going away off to VPP. And on the common line, you've got this network of pots, resistors, and the transistors there. And then coming from the CPU, you've got two digital I.O. lines coming in to basically turn these two transistors on or off. So let's take a look at an example. If this line here is high, P25 is high, P24 is low, then a high on here will turn on this NPN transistor, which will effectively pull down the base of this PNP transistor, which will turn it fully on. Now, because you get a volt drop across the collector emitter on these transistors, you're going to get a small volt drop between the COM and the actual ground. So it's you're going to get 12 point something volts coming out on the VPP. I've assumed a half a volt drop across there. So here we go on my truth table here, 12.5 volts option for VPP. Now of course in this particular case it doesn't matter what P24 is doing because the only connection from this other part of the circuit is via the base on this PMP transistor. And because it's being pulled low, like I said, it doesn't really matter what this one's doing. However, things change. If both these digital I.O. lines are low, then these two transistors here are turned off. And what you're left with is a resistor ladder from VPP all the way down to ground. And depending on the position of the wiper of this potentiometer, it will bias this PMP transistor on or off to some degree. In other words, it can adjust the voltage at the common pin of the regulator. And depending on where it's set, you could get quite a high voltage across the, the collector emitter. And therefore, that's where I'm thinking you're going to get something like your 21 or 25 volts output on the VPP. But then, if you turn on P24 and leave P25 off, then what effectively this transistor here is going to do is short the wiper down to ground on this potentiometer, therefore changing the resistance at this point here between it and ground. And that will then bias this point here on this potentiometer, which in turn biases the base on the transistor. So you're going to get a slightly different voltage at the emitter of this transistor here depending on where this potentiometer has been set to as well as this one has been set to when this transistor is turned on. So overall what you're able to get out in VPP is three different voltages depending on the state of these two digital I.O. lines. So a little truth table shows exactly how that's working and uh, I haven't filled in the voltages for VPP for that second and third option because they are subject to the position of the potentiometers. That's how I think it works anyway. So let's remove the transformer and fit the new one.